This is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. In just two days, voters across Idaho will head to the polls to decide who they want to represent them in key federal, state, and local offices. The midterm general election is this Tuesday, November 8th. Polling locations will be open from 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. Of course, a lot of people have already voted early at early voting locations or by filling out absentee ballots. Early voting closed on Friday. Anyone who still has their absentee ballot needs to turn that into your county clerk's office by 8 o'clock election night. For information on the election, including what's going to be on your ballot specifically, interviews with candidates, how to find your polling location, and more, check out our KTVB voter guide. It's on our website right now, or you can text the word vote to the number on your screen. That's 208-321-5614. We'll send a link directly to your phone. Idaho is a very red state. Republicans dominate the voter rolls, but there is a large number of unaffiliated voters followed by registered Democrats. According to the Secretary of State's office, as of October 4th, there are just under 1 million registered voters in Idaho. Of those, 577,000 are Republican, 129,000, almost 130,000 are Democrat, 277,000 unaffiliated, 11,223 Libertarians, and 4,026 members of the Constitution Party. Today on Viewpoint, we are previewing the 2022 general election. We'll focus on the major statewide races we've featured here on Viewpoint and in our KTVB debate, including the race for U.S. Senate, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, and Superintendent of Public Instruction. Joining me today are the host of Idaho Public Television's Idaho Reports, Melissa Davlin, and KTVB Chief Political Reporter, Joe Paris. Good morning to you two. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Doug. It's always and, exciting, right? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I talked with Deputy Secretary of State Chad Houck the other day, and he said that those numbers haven't really updated yet as far as numbers, and that we are over a million registered voters now. Pretty impressive when you consider that Idaho's total population is 1.8 million, wouldn't you think? Absolutely, and I think that especially as interest in the general election is starting to build, a lot of people don't tune in until a week before the election or so, right. which is, I know, foreign for us political junkies. But I think we're going to see those numbers go up, especially because Idaho is one of those states that still allows same-day voter registration mm -hmm. at the polls. So we are going to see that number go up. Uh, as far as turnout, though, for the number of registered voters who actually do show up and cast their ballots, for general elections, that usually hovers around 60 percent, so we'll see what happens. All right. And let's take a look at some of the big races right now, starting with the race for governor. Governor Brad Little, of course, running for a second term. His opponents are Democrat Stephen Height and Independent Ammon Bundy. So, Joe, first of all, just what are your impressions about the way this race is shaping up? You know, when I think about this race, it's hard not to think back to four years ago, where at this point we're talking about Brad Little and Paulette Jordan. And, you know, you fast forward four years later, this is just a much different conversation. Um, as you mentioned in the beginning of the show, the Republicans have such a strong majority here. Um, we've seen the, ca uh, the campaign for Mr. Height really not run as strongly as we saw Paulette Jordan mm -hmm. um, four years ago. We saw Paulette out in the communities across Idaho really strongly campaigning. We saw online ads, we saw television ads, the hype campaign, we we're just not seeing that. So in terms of the attention on the race, it seems like it's not the most important race in terms of people talking visibility. about it. Yeah, yeah, visibility, which is strange, you know, for every four years, the big one, the governor's race. So it, it seems like the race to me is taking a back seat and hasn't dominated conversation, which is really interesting thinking back to four years ago where we thought, okay, this is going to set up the direction of the state. I think the real conversation that I'm hearing is speculation on how much of the vote Ammon Bundy is going to take from that traditional Republican voter core. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people who supported Janice McGeehan and also Ed Humphreys in in the primary mm -hmm. are going to support Ammon Bundy. We, we've seen a strong fundraising game, especially for an independent candidate. You know, more than $600,000 the last time I checked. And of course, those reports will get updated. Money is still coming in. Brad Little's at more than $2 million. You know, he, ha he has the financial advantage. He has the name recognition. He, he has the support of so many lawmakers in the PACs. But Ammon Bundy, the percentage of vote that he's going to get, I think, will surprise people. I think he has more support than people realize. And I think when you talk about grassroots support, I think he is someone who genuinely has that. And you could talk about what his politics are all day, but in terms of just running a campaign, 
the spots he's run online on YouTube are extremely highly produced and very impressive from a production level. We've seen a lot of his signs across the community. Just, just this past week, we saw a big mm -hmm. sign about don't vote, the QR codes many people have seen across the valley. So in terms of the attention on this race, there's a lot of people that I think that say, well, he's just a third party candidate. He's probably going to get a few thousand votes. But what you touched on is there's a lot of members of the Idaho Republican Party in Idaho that are not happy with Brad Little as the primary winner. Mm -hmm. So they are going to be looking to send their vote somewhere else. So McGee and followers, uh, Ide Humphrey supporters, as, as Davlin touched on here, it, it's a very interesting setup in terms of a path to victory. I'm not sure what that looks like, but there is not, you know, there's not no attention on Ammon Bundy, and especially with what Stephen Hyde is doing in his campaign, it's interesting to see how this will shake out. I think the path to victory might have been narrow, but it would have been there had we had a stronger Democratic candidate who might be taking some of those moderate votes away from Brad Little. Um, but, but as you said, you know, this Democratic candidate hasn't been campaigning quite as hard, um, and so I, I think that 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 third party path to victory, like what we might see in, in Oregon with that three-way race that's with three very strong candidates, um, it's very, very narrow for Bundy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of Ammon Bundy supporters realize that. I've seen chatter online that's along those lines. So the question isn't whether or not he's going to win, but how much of that support is going to, to end up in that Bundy category and what that's going to look like in years ahead. Let's go to the next race, which actually has been higher profile than the governor's race, and that's the lieutenant governor's race. Mm -hmm. um, that is, of course, between Idaho's longest serving Speaker of the House, Scott Vedke. He is going up against Boise attorney Democrat Terry Pickens Manweiler. And as we mentioned, this has been a, a much higher profile race for lieutenant governor than any lieutenant governor's race I can remember in the past. They're both running TV ads. Scott bedke has been running them for a long time. And now Terry Pickens Manweiler is on the airwaves as well. So this is really kind of unusual, I guess, that the lieutenant governor's race is getting such attention. Four years ago, we had a very different general election lieutenant governor race between Janice McGeehan, who, who was very conservative, you know, mm -hmm. um, opponents couched her as far right, and Kristen McCollum. You, you see the same kind of candidate in Terry Pickens Manweiler, somebody who says, look, I, I used to be a Republican right. until 2016. And when then she I says the party parties. left her. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You have a very different candidate in Scott Bedke, too, than you had in Janice McGee. And he's saying, I, I'm going to bring dignity and respect back to the lieutenant governor's office. I'm going to work with the governor and not against them. Um, so, so, again, I think that uh, that is a much more... Um, active and interesting race. We we hosted a debate for these two candidates on Idaho Public Television and because Pickens Manweiler hasn't held public office before, a lot of it focused on Scott Bedke's record because he does have a lengthy one. As you mentioned, the longest serving speaker of the House and a lot has happened in the last 10 years since he became speaker. Um, so, not to mention just the last two years, huh? <laughs> absolutely. No, there was there was plenty to talk about that we didn't even get to. And so so that's what it's really focused on is is bed keys record as opposed to maybe what the the lieutenant governor, whoever wins that position would yeah. do. And Joe, you know, the big issue uh, has been abortion yeah. in the lieutenant governor's race. And, and, you know, as, as Melissa touched on, there's not much of a record that Terry Pickens Manweiler has to defend because she is newer to public office. Meanwhile, Scott Bedke, I mean, he's one of the longest serving legislators of all time. He's the longest speaker of the House in, in House history in Idaho. So he's got a lot to defend. But a lot of people have been touching on what you highlighted, Doug, is, is this coming down to a one topic race. And of course, abortion and, and women's health care rights is a huge debate in our community right now. And there's been a lot of focus from the uh, Manweiler Pickens campaign uh, on that. So it, it'll be interesting to see you know where this goes in terms of you know when someone's elected how do they handle the office in the Idaho public television debate uh, the other night I really liked the focus on what would be like your passionate issue because as, as Doug and I have talked about in the past on viewpoint the lieutenant governor has this really unique I guess priority where they can kind of say okay this is what this office is about and this is what we're going to do it, it, that came up in our discussions as we were planning for the debate. Of all the statewide offices, this is the most amorphous. This is one where whoever wins that race can really take that office and take that platform and make it what they want to make. Janice McGeehan focused on education, indoctrination. Brad Little, when he was in that office, transportation, infrastructure, health care. So we'll see whoever wins that race what they're going to make their big issue. All right, let's switch over now to another really interesting race. That is the race for Idaho Attorney General. Yes. In this race, former U.S. Congressman Raul Labrador beat five-time incumbent Lawrence Wasden in the primary to go up against Democrat Tom Arkush, who replaced a placeholder candidate this summer in this race. So, um, 
Melissa, this has been one of the more contentious races with each candidate kind of lobbying insults or claims against each other, basically calling each other extreme and political activists. Absolutely. And, and what I'm really seeing now is, is Rojo Labrador is, is trying to walk this line, be say, uh, trying to walk this line by saying, I will be the conservative attorney general. I'm going to defend Idaho's laws more aggressively than Lawrence Waz did. And I am going to shake things up. But he's, he's pushing back against this idea that he's going to burn the place down. He's, he's really trying to say, look, I, I'm not going to be hyper-partisan. I'm going to work with people. I, pushing it back against this idea that he's an extremist and a political opportunist. And I think, too, when you see um, some... Republicans who were really active in the party, you know, 10, 15 years ago, coming out and endorsing um, Tom Arkush instead of him. This, there's this bigger narrative here about how much and if the party has transformed. Like you mentioned with Terry Pickens Manweiler, has, has the party left these folks? How much is it transforming? And we're seeing this really play out, I think, uh, on a bigger issues, level. For sure. And Joe, what's, what's your take on the, the Republicans supporting Tom Arkush? Because yeah. when I interviewed um, Congressman Labrador here on Viewpoint, he mentioned that he, he kind of feels that that support for Arkush is backfiring against Arkush because um, it's energizing Labrador supporters to, to go out, campaign, and to, to get out the vote. Well, this AG's race to me is just fascinating because it, it is a microcosm of the Republican Party right now in the sense that you have the old guard of the Republican Party that, as we've seen in press conferences, you know, people like Lori Otter out there talking and stumping for Tom Arkush. Mm -hmm. But when you talk to Mr. Labrador about the situation, he'll say, yeah, he's got these Republicans supporting him like Jim Jones, but these are all Republicans that are either on their way out of office or essentially retired decades ago. So it's very interesting, the Republicans that are supporting Tom Arkush, and it's interesting, the Republicans that are speaking out for Raul Labrador. Um, another thing I want to touch on, though, is the staffing of the AG's office. Just this past week, more staffers have left, notably Megan LaRondo, who is basically trying the case for the state of Idaho for the AG's office on the abortion laws in the Supreme Court. So she leaves, and it's, it's another person leaving that office, like Brian Keynes, where you ask, are people leaving because they're nervous about what's going to be the future of that office no matter what, or are they preparing for this extremist conversation? But something that Melissa touched on that I wanted to highlight is that if you talk percentage-wise of how many people are actually leaving that office, it's a low percentage, but the names leaving are significant, so I'm, I'm very curious to see how either would handle that office. I mean, Lawrence Wazen was in office for so long, and you have this change of regime, no matter who it is, there's going to be turnover. Correct. So, you see that. Uh, that every general election when there's a new person coming in so we just have a couple of minutes left but I want to get through two more races so we'll get brief comments on these and this is the the next one is the superintendent of public instruction candidates who debated here on KTVB former state board of education president Republican Debbie Critchfield on the right is running against former Idaho Education Association president Terry Gilbert and uh, Melissa much of our debate focused on school vouchers and that has really and Terry Gilbert's pushing that saying that Debbie Critchfield supports vouchers where people can take public money and go to private school. And I know that a lot of people in the Critchfield camp and in the Republican Party as a whole are pushing back against this idea that school choice automatically means vouchers, that there are many, many kinds of, or there, there are many ways that you can get a school choice program into a state without necessarily taking money directly from public schools. Uh, what, what I noticed was there, there wasn't necessarily a specific concrete plan from the Critchfield camp, she said, you know, in, in our debate and yours, that she was open to ideas and that she wanted to have this conversation, that she supported school choice. How that plays out if she does win the election, I think, um, is going to be a major topic, especially after the special session and that big investment into education. And in, like, in terms of like the set pieces around her in the education community, for her to dive in with the full plan, I think she's got to be waiting to see, okay, who are the people around me? What does this landscape look like before I commit to a plan? Mm -hmm. But you're right. I was curious when we were sitting here during our debate. I said, okay, what specifically, what is the plan? So I guess we'll find out uh, yeah. <laughs> hopefully soon. Yeah, right. All right. One more race here before we take a break, and that is the race for U.S. Senate. Senator Mike Crapo running for his fifth term against Democrat David Roth and independent conservative Scott Cleveland. All three appeared at different times here on Viewpoint. Senator Crapo is basically running a barrage of TV ads. You turn on the TV, you see Senator <laughs> Crapo pretty much. Do either of you expect any surprises in this race with the long-term incumbent well-known? I, I think it is, again, a narrow path to victory for David Roth. Uh, Mike Crapo has... You talk about people who have been in office 
I mean, for decades. Mike Crapo was in the legislature starting in the 80s. He's a very powerful member of the U.S. Senate. The, that doesn't mean that these races are worth nothing, though, because David Roth, you know, both on, on viewpoint and in our debate, raised some very important issues that and very co big concerns that a lot of Idahoans have. And I also know that Scott Cleveland has hit, you know, hit, a, hit a, a note with a lot of people in our community, and I don't want to associate him with other campaigns, but, you know, there's, I've heard a lot of similar things from supporters of Ammon Bundy that I've heard, you know, from supporters of Scott Cleveland. So there is a market there, so to speak, in terms of connecting with people, you know, on, on their current political ideology yeah. that some might feel are not in the mainstream Republican Party. And he's a big supporter of America First. Right. And President Trump's policies, although he says he doesn't like the meanness sometimes. So, <laughs> um, all right, we're going to leave it right there, but up next, on Viewpoint, the changing face or faces of the Idaho legislature, why there will be a bunch of new lawmakers when the next session starts in January. Welcome back to Viewpoint. We're previewing the 2022 general election and turning our attention to the changing face or faces of the state legislature. Redistricting based on the 2020 census moved district boundaries to square up with the growing and changing population. Every legislative district in Idaho has to have roughly the same number of people in them. That along with some retirements is leading to a rather sizable turnover in both chambers. And when you look at the makeup of the Idaho state legislature, it has long been dominated by Republicans. This current legislature has 58 Republicans and 12 Democrats representing the people of Idaho in the House and in the Senate, 28 Republicans and only seven Democrats hold seats. Also an interesting note, there are 72 men and 33 women in the Idaho legislature, so women do make up just under a third of all lawmakers. Once again, joining me today are the host of Idaho Public Television's Idaho Reports, Melissa Davlin, and KTVB chief political reporter Joe Paris. So, Melissa, can you explain this? How did the, the moving of these district lines end up leading to this, what we're going to see, a pretty massive turnover in the legislature? Some of the incumbent lawmakers got, re, we, we say, redistricted out of the legislative district where they lived. And so they had to basically campaign to a new, uh, a, a new set of residents, a new set of citizens. Um, some incumbents were redistricted together, meaning that they had to run against each other. We saw that. So they served in separate districts and now they're. And now they're the together. And so we, we saw that play out in the primary, especially. And we saw a lot of incumbents lose. I've never seen so many incumbents lose in. <laughs> In a primary, and that, that was part of it. But we also saw a lot of very strong primary challenges, especially against um, sitting Republican uh, House and Senate members, and, and a number of those folks lost in May. And so you had this combination of new districts, incumbent versus incumbent, um, and, and as you mentioned, retirements, that has led to not quite 50% turnover already, but pretty darn close. What was it, Joe? 40? At least 40 based of on the, the primary, and there could be even more. Exactly, because now that we have the general election coming up, there are some, there, there are four districts that I'm keeping a really, really close eye okay. on where, where some of the uh, incumbent lawmakers might lose their seats to, once again, very strong challenges. Joe, with this shift, I mean, we hear a lot about, you know, there's the Democratic Party and then there are the two Republican parties <laughs> in, in the legislature. There's the, the moderate <clears throat> branch and then there's the more more conservative, the right, um, even farther right leaning. Are you sensing a shift in the political winds um, with this turnover that we're going to have? Well, based on some social media traffic I've seen on candidates that hope to win on Tuesday, you get this idea that the Idaho legislature could be really shifting more to the right in terms of conservative values. At the same time, though, there's a lot of the more of those conservative, those those right leaning candidates, or I would say politicians, that won't be there anymore. The, I guess the Freedom Caucus in the Idaho House has had a lot of power and they've had a lot of decisions and a lot of impact on decisions. And some of the major players like Priscilla Giddings, no longer there. Tammy Nichols moving over to the Senate. Uh, of course, Dorothy Moon is now leading the Republican Party here in the state of Idaho. The chairwoman. The chairwoman, person, yeah. yeah. So it'll be interesting to see who steps into places and how that really, I guess, fills out. Because there, there is such a thing as freshman lawmakers feeling nervous and coming in. And they've got a lot to learn. They do. It's about the process to start off. And they have fewer people to look up to to learn that process. Because because there are so many new faces. So the legislature and really the House and the Senate, because the, the truth is that people will say the House is more of the Wild West. <laughs> but now there's this 
thought process of, you know, in terms of some moving to the Senate and who could get elected in the Senate, you could have more of a volatile state house altogether. The running joke at the state house is usually, okay, we'll see what the house does, and then, you know, the Senate will kind of go through and they'll, they'll kind of filter it. it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fix it. That's just kind of the running joke. Right. It may not be that way anymore. It, you know, it, it might not be, um, but what we've also seen in the past is a lot of freshman lawmakers who have this reputation for once again coming in, shaking things up, flipping a table, they they get there and some of them some of them do push back against that precedent, but some of them uh, end up once they learn the ropes are aren't quite what we thought they would be. Either they're they're more conservative or they are or they moderate a little bit once they learn how the process actually works. I want to talk about a couple other issues in the two minutes or so that we have left. Um, Joe, what's with election integrity being such a big issue, election security, mm. um, we're hearing about poll watchers. Um, what, have, what have you found out in, in your reporting with how that's going? Well, I can say, you know, in Ada County specifically, I spoke with Clerk McGrain uh, this past week, and he told me that they have basically a record amount of applications or paperwork in to have poll watchers. A large majority of them coming from the, the Bundy campaign, the Ammon Bundy for Governor campaign. Now, Phil McGrain tells me that, you know, the Bundy supporters, they've checked a box on their own paperwork saying, we're not going to interfere with the elections. We know the spotlight that's on us. We know the, the media story of surrounding poll watchers and poll challengers. So I wouldn't be surprised if we had at least one, I don't want to call it an incident, but one back and forth. But I, I, I am interested to see how this shakes out, really not just in Ada County, but across the state. Right. I, I, we have 44 counties, and each one of them has their own process, their own clerks who are going to be watching this. Poll watchers aren't new. Th this is something that happens every election, but it has so much more of a focus in Idaho and nationwide right now because of the last few years. And so that, that increase that you talked about, uh, we, we are going to see that statewide and um, and it's not just going to be at the ballot drop boxes and at polling locations, but I think it's also going to be where they're counting the ballots, too. And I know there's been a lot of conversation in Idaho political circles about guns at polling locations. And to be clear here, guns are allowed at polling locations unless they're not allowed there in regular times. Meaning, let's say a polling a location school. is a school, you can't have a gun at school. But if, you know, if, if it's a community center where guns are allowed, you can have someone who's a poll watcher you know, holding a gun legally. And that's just a conversation and reality of living in Idaho. So it's something that I talk about with county clerks. They say, we don't necessarily think these are people that are trying to intimidate people, but with the way the gun laws are in Idaho, it could certainly look that way to someone. Yeah, and fin finally, Melissa, just 30 seconds left. Um, it seems to me that Idaho has done a really good job with election security we, over the years. We still, we still have paper ballots. We uh, have... The legislature has only strengthened the auditing process um, in the last few years, not in response to any specific concerns necessarily or issues that we've had in Idaho, but just to respond to this nationwide conversation to make sure that Idaho, um, that Idaho elections are in fact secure. And so hopefully that will reassure voters that the process is safe and secure. Melissa Dablin from Idaho Public Television's Idaho Reports, KTVB Chief Political Reporter Joe Paris, thanks for being here today really great discussion on all of what's coming up on Tuesday. We'll be right back. One more reminder, the KTVB Voter Guide has information on absentee ballot deadlines, what's going to be on your ballot specifically, how to find your polling location, candidate interviews, and more. We can send that directly to your phone. All you have to do is text the word vote to the number on your screen. That's 208-321-5614 or check out the voter guide on ktvb.com. And be sure to join us for our full election day coverage throughout the day on Tuesday. And we'll have the early results for you starting at 9 p.m. when the polls close in northern Idaho, which is in the Pacific time zone. That is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. Make your voice heard on Election Day. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you on the news tonight as well. Have a great day.